going to do is, it, it's hard for me to tell at this point um, what victims, if any, are going to want to testify and what type of information is going to be provided to the court. Um, what I'll do, though, is request that the, or order the media, one, to comply with all local rules, and number two, is that um, all victims' faces are going to be tiled, referred to by their initials. If you can't tile, then you're not to shoot their faces. And I'll let you use your discretion in not shooting their faces. And you can shoot their bodies or however you experts want to deal with it. Okay, um, so I'm going to sign those orders. Um, Ms. Von Helm, do you wave a ring judgment and sentence? Yes, no, I do. Okay. So, um, first of all, I appreciate the uh, parties. Um, submission of documents. Um, I've read uh, not only the probation report, statements of mitigation, statements and aggravation, and supplemental sentencing reports. Um, I also uh, went back over my preliminary hearing notes since I'm the one who heard all the victims testify. Um, I read the uh, psychological reports of um, Dr. Lipson, Dr. Carroll, Dr. Clipson. Um, I reviewed the uh, probation report. I reviewed the um, numerous uh, statements from the victims. Um, additionally, uh, I considered uh, Marcy's law and its application in this case, which I'm going to have to have an extensive dialogue about. Um, let me also note that there were papers filed um, and a rebuttal filed by the DA's office, I think, Friday. I was not at work on Friday. Um, in response, the DA's response was to a, a document filed by uh, Mr. Aguirre. I read those documents, so I'm not really sure what the call is on those uh, documents and the request, nor am I sure who represents who in the civil matter. Um, nor is that really something that I need to fundamentally consider um, for the purposes of sentencing in this case. I will say this, that um, I'm not going to unseal the documents that I sealed, but I will address them. There were reasons for me to seal the documents, and most of that is for the protection of the victims not so ironically, under Marcy's law. The first sealed document was a document on February the 22nd, 2018. Those are the criminal protective orders with the actual names of the victims in full, with their dates of birth and their complete names spelled out. Obviously, the sexual assault victims, um, they have a right, and the court has a duty to protect um, the exploitation of those names and the expression of those names in the public. So I sealed the criminal protective orders. The redacted criminal protective orders exist in the open section of the court's file entitled People vs. Fisher. There's documents for May the 30th, 2018. Those are the witness lists with the full names of the witnesses who appeared at the prelim. Again, those names are sealed at the preliminary hearing. Those witnesses were addressed by either initials or just first name, last initial. Those, those um, witness lists will continue to remain sealed until further notice, and I don't see a reason now to um, destroy that confidentiality. May 31st, 2018, again, a new set of criminal protective orders were filed. I was in, with the entire name of the victims in that criminal protective order. Those were filed, and I accepted those under seal. December 7, 2018, I placed the defendant's passport as a condition of bail under seal. Um, I don't see a reason to keep the defendant's passport after sentencing today nor do I see a reason to keep it sealed. So I'll be unsealing and returning the passport to the defendant.
invented. February the 20th, 2019, the Sheriff's Department filed a motion to quash on a subpoena deuces taken. The subpoena was issued by the defendant's prior um, criminal defense lawyer. The sheriff responded to the request. Both documents contain the victim's names in total. So I sealed those documents instead of forcing the executive branch to redact. It seemed easier for me to seal it again. These are victim names. And so I believe they still have a right of confidentiality. The, I, there was a July 11th email. This is from Mr. Gillian to, I believe, the DA and Ms. Von Helm. That email I originally sealed because of the, at the time, the nature of the negotiations that were going on between the parties and myself. I unsealed that on July 24th, seeing that there was no confidentiality and that the victim's names were not being specifically listed in the documents, and it was rather in the document. And the document itself is rather generic. Additionally, for the purposes of sentencing today, I will later mark that email. Um, for review by any of the parties or the public. There was a July 24, 2019, where I issued an order permitting the sealed filing of the people's response to an allegation of misconduct. Um, I intend to keep that sealed because of the nature of the complaint, which I find ungrounded, unwarranted, um, and uh, frivolous. Um, the reason why I'm sealing it is because there are victim names within the response, and it's fairly specific, so I'm gonna continue to have that sealed. Also, there is a September the 4th, 2019 um, document that I sealed that is the declaration of certain victims, which the victims refer to themselves, the names are prevalent, and again, under Marcy's law, I'm unwilling to unseal that. The victims actually possess the documents that they wish to hand that to the media or hand that to anybody else or their counsel wish to, that's up to them, but the court's not going to engage in <coughs> unsealing the declaration of specific victims. There are uh, documents from June the 1st, 2018. And uh, is Ms. Delano in the court? Yes, I am, Your Honor. Yeah, so we had a dialogue, uh, counsel, about this during the prelim. There were fi misdemeanor files of your client, I don't need to name your client, um, which I sealed in order to protect your client's right to privacy under Marcy's law. I think the people are going to take some action on some of those files today. Um, but there's data within those files, the court files, that I didn't want the media or other parties to have access to, which would not only disclose <coughs> the victim's name in the case, but also um, the general location of the victim, her specific address, where she frequents, and also some matters that I think um, would be embarrassing to the victim. And I think also they were unwarranted prosecutions um, due to the final outcome of this case. Um, I might inquire of people now. Um, do you understand what documents I'm referring to? Yes. Is, and I think there's still live cases. Is, yes. Is it the people's intent to dismiss them? We were going to um, be entertaining a motion from Ms. Delano. Well, I don't think Ms. Delano has to bring it. I'm going to request um, that there is a case number here. Let me uh, read this. CN35723.
729 that appears to be a probationary case. Um, is there a people's motion to dismiss those two actions? Yes. Okay. And the objection was one. Okay. And what I'm going to do also um, is on my own motion, I'm going to waive fees. I'm going to um, sign a motion, a, a order to expunge the records. Okay. So I've dealt with those. They will remain sealed. All right. Is there any objection, Mr. Long? SG. <coughs> Is that a no? I don't think so. It's, I don't recognize it's that. Mr. Gilliland. Mr. Gilliland. Mr. Gilliland in the courtroom? Is there a people's motion on that case that is ending? Two, it's a closed case, so it's 234. I'm going to grant an expungement on that particular case. Okay. All right, so those are the um, sealed documents. Additionally, there are protective orders for each individual victim that I've referred to for the February 22nd sealing. Um, each one of those is sealed and then filed under Jane Doe 1 through 16. So that's the, the limits to what I have sealed and what I have just explained. I find a good cause to keep the, the remainder of those documents sealed unless I hear a specific objection. Okay. The uh, defendant has requested in their statement in mitigation certain documents be accepted by the court and filed under seal. The uh, defense has submitted psychiatric records that the court has to rely on to reach a couple of different issues in the sentencing. So I'm going to reject and overrule the defense request to seal the psychiatric records at this point. The defendant at the court's request submitted his service record handbook, his military records which contain information about his family, his daughter, um, his social security number, his uh, address. Pardon, Ms. Von Helm? His address. Yeah, I got that. You'll let me finish. All right, personal data. Um, so I'm going to take that document after we are done with the sentencing. I'm going to seal the defendant's service record handbook. The letters that the defendant submitted from various um, witnesses and family members I've read and I've considered, I'm not going to seal those documents either. Okay? Uh, do you want to make a record, Ms. Mahal? Um, yes, yeah, sir. Sure. I would ask that I be able to redact them then because... Redact the letters, what? Um, off of the letters. So I'll take it in two parts. So there's the psychiatric records, some of which lay out his address, location, that kind of thing. If I could just look at them before you unseal them and redact any um, personal information and address and location of the defendant's family. Um, the second request, Your Honor, would be for the letters. They, some of them have phone numbers and addresses of the person that wrote them. If I could just redact them and then submit them in the redacted form, I believe they should not be subject to online harassment. There has been, in this case, online harassment from um, not so much the parties, but other people involved in spectators, I'll call them, that have made 
comments about the court, about the DA's office, about me, about my client's family, um, which are um, threatening and uh, grumbling about the process. And I don't want someone from online to feel empowered to there, Have there been specific threats? No specific threats, like I'm going to come and kill you. But there's been grumblings, and I would just want to redact their phone What's number. What's a grumbling? Comments about the corruption of the court, the corruption of counsel, that sort of thing. And I don't want them to reach out with those people's phone numbers and start harassing those people if they have their phone numbers online. So do people want to be heard? So what I'll do is I'll take all the letters, the service record handbook, I'll take them under seal. I will release a redacted set of letters. I did not see personal identifying information in the psychiatrist report, but uh, I'll allow the defense before we close business today to go through them. And if I have to, I'll seal those and then um, <coughs> allow the public and the court file to have an open, um, redacted copy. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, the, uh, both parties have requested, and I agree, that um, the July 10th email to Mr. Gillian is going to be marked for the sentencing only as courts one. And then um, there is a chart that the parties created to allow me to understand the victim statements. And we're going to mark that courts two. Um, does either side have a copy of both those documents? <coughs> Give them to Madam Clerk. Uh, I think that a copy was filed yesterday. Um, That's the preliminary issues. Let's talk now about um, how we're going to proceed here. I think what I'm going to allow, and I realize um, this is kind of a work in progress for the people and uh, for the defense. After I read the probation report and read the people's attempt to contact the um, witnesses, victims in the case, I didn't anticipate that it was going to be this difficult. Um, but what I'll do is I'll open up with the people, and I'll give you a chance to rebut also. But I would, if there are, if you know of any victims who wish to make a statement under Marcy's law, I'm willing to receive that now. Thank you, Your Honor. Tanya D. And you want her referred to as Tanya D. That's fine. Okay, next. Nora G. Next. 
Deborah A. Liza R. Wendy F. Terry S. Next. Cynthia M. Okay. Next. Dana N. Michelle, uh, Michelle P. Pamela G. And then Tammy M. And I'm hoping that's all of them. If there's three left over, then you don't know. represent this two. No. Um, MY. What actually happened, I think she was looking for me, but she ended up with Doug Gilliland. Um, but uh, she's with a different address. Shelly H. No, I do not represent her. Mr. Young, that's yours? Yes. That's H and then also KP. I have a letter just for the point. I'll get you. Don't worry about that. You, you KP is yours also? Yes. How about Christina H? Yes. Yours? Yes. Yes, that's correct. So as of July 10th? Yes, that's correct. As of recently. Okay. Okay. All right, now do you want to address them one by one or in totality? I think it'd be easiest the totality, okay. um, unless something particular comes up for uh, one of the victims. Uh, the ports exhibit number one apparently is my July 10 email, and that's probably a good place to start because that's where I first uh, made us a, a comment on behalf of the, the victims uh, under Marcy's law. Okay, and at that time, um, the, the point that I made on behalf of all of them that was that they wanted the case to settle, they needed the case to settle for lots of reasons, and that they were not going to be making any demands as it related to uh, any of the, really, the sentencing, in particular the sex registration and a felony, you know, whether or not he's convicted of a felony. Now, at that time, by the way, Your Honor, I believe only two 
had ever had been charged, their, you know, their, their incidents had been charged as sex crimes. And uh, I believe only um, one had been charged as a felony. Now, I'm not a criminal attorney, so I... Um, that, that, that's incorrect. Okay, yeah. but the vast... But just so the records go, there were multiple felonies. There was a specific sex crime charge under 1192.7 that when that charge exists, the people, the court, and the defense are prohibited from negotiating under the California Penal Code. Right. The vast majority of them, I believe, were charged as uh, batteries, misdemeanors. No, they were charged as felonies under Penal Code Section 149. Battery under the color of authority. Okay. Uh, that's what I found over on felonies. That's why. I've that, that's that's that. fine, and that's again, that's the understanding that we had. And um, at that time, they simply said, um, "We are not making any demands." Sure. Because they wanted the case to settle. Um, that uh, because of the July 10 email. That prompted something that happened the following week uh, with a phone call to one of the victims in which she was asked whether or not she and I talked about this and what we had talked about. And that was, in my opinion, a violation of the attorney-client privilege. And, and that's a fair um, presumption, except, so, and Mr. Gillian, I don't mean to quarrel with you. Uh, my job today is to sentence the defendant right. and hear from the victims. I, I don't care about the civil case. Um, the the email was directed to both the prosecution and the defense, but of course, it ended up in my lap. Correct. And to be explicit and to be accurate, the email says, quote, I have confirmed that none of my clients or victims in the people's case are demanding that Mr. Fisher plead guilty to a felony or register as a sex offender. Each of my clients would prefer that this case not proceed to trial and instead be resolved with a plea deal, end quote. So that is when um, I had to take the levers in this case because when, as you know, this is a trial attorney, that when um, parties, and particularly in a criminal case, where victims don't want to proceed to trial, um, it dramatically changed the posture of the case in the terms of prosecution and also in terms of the defense and it created as we were getting ready for trial and they're allowed to say these things they're, they're allowed to change their minds right that's part of being a victim of crime and they are victims there's no doubt about that but it, because of this email I had to order the prosecution to interview the victims so that I had more data to rely on in negotiating the case and to determine what the appropriate sentence in this case is. And, it's, and I still have, you know, holes in the case as to what the victim's desires are because they are ever evolving. So the email did have dramatic consequences on the case. They're allowed to have different feelings about the case at different times. I don't have a problem with it. But the <coughs> prosecution was ordered by this court to communicate with the victims, as the probation department has a statutory obligation to communicate with the victims. You may proceed. Your Honor, uh, I'm not aware of any order, um, no one have ever told me of an order, okay. where you uh, informed the DA and ordered the DA to talk to my clients. Um, I know that on July 24, the DA asked you for that order and you refused to give it. That's what the record, the transcript says. It was at the next hearing was the first time any comment was ever made by you that you, in fact, had ordered them. And it's, and I'm allowed to make orders. I do it all the time. I'm, I'm not aware of any order. I um, made the order. And it's actually, it's in both of the defense and prosecution's paper throughout the motions that were filed from August to the present day. I ordered them to do it. Yeah, I, I, I'm focusing on the July 24 transcript where you said, I cannot order you to do that. I wasn't ready to. Okay. So at some point after July 24, um, I never once said that the victims uh, did not want to go to trial or were not willing to go to trial. I'm not aware of any victim that ever wants to go to trial. Okay, I just I just quoted your document, sir. My document said they would prefer this case okay. to settle okay. instead of go to trial. All right. And we said, and they also said that uh, we're not making any demands, right? Now. Um, as a result of you, that, you said the people, the people demanding that 
that you were not demanding that he plead guilty to a felony or register as a sex offender and would prefer the case not to go to trial. Okay, exactly. I get it. But you're a trial lawyer too in a different environment and we take these things to heart. We listen to victims and the DA did. Okay, uh, another point I want to make is that my client's um, thoughts on this case and what they wanted to say to the court has not been evolving. Well, they, they've you, been you consistent. You may choose your language, all right? They, they've been consistent. What, what is it that you want me to know about the victims? I'm, I'm trying to get to that. Get to on it. July t uh, 10, I sent this email, and um, it, it, and each of my the clients today are reaffirming that email. Okay, that they're not making any hear, demands. So, Mr. Gilly. I need to hear what the victims have to say, not what you have to say. Right. I am telling you what the victims have to say. Okay. Let's okay. hear it. All right. So um, they also want to make sure that the court, uh, they want the court to know that they at no point ever told the DA that they felt strongly that, that sex registration must be part of any plea deal because what that meant was that they would rather go to trial than um, then there be a, a, a plea deal without sex registration. And that simply is not the case. They did not want to go to trial. They wanted the case to resolve, and they were not making any demands. Also, by the way, as the court has mentioned, you cannot negotiate sex registration as part of a plea deal. So I'm not sure how that could possibly could have happened in the first place. But that statement that had been made to this court by the DA repeatedly is not correct. They want the court to know that. Um, the declarations, um, after all of this started, the declarations that I submitted to you directly um, on September 4th, those, those declarations there, uh, they pointed out a, a few things. And one of them um, that was very consistent with that was that that statement that the DA had made to you, that they would rather go to trial than let Mr. Fisher go, um, go get away with not having sex registration, was not true. So let me ask you this. Are, are, do the victims want me to know how they feel about sentencing under Marcy's law, or do the victims want me to know how you feel about the DA's office and the defense? The, well, that's a good, good question, because uh, one of the victims actually did want me to uh, address how she felt about the DA's office and the criminal justice system. Um, as you so, are aware... So, then, so, Mr. Gillian, then let's hear it. But I'm still hearing opinion from you in argument about the DA's office. I, I don't really care what the DA's office did in this case. The defendant pled guilty to these charges, and I have to get to sentencing. So the issue before me is, and, and just like the order I gave the DA's office, what do they want to see in the sentence under Marcy's law? Doesn't mean I'm going to follow it, but that I want to hear from the victims. I, I wanted to, I'm trying to get to that, and I probably would be finished by now. I'm, I'm, it's a very Mr. Mr. Gillian, I'll, I'll shut you down in just a second, okay? You don't need to. Your phone goes off again. Folks from Iger, cell phone's off. You can proceed with the victim's wishes. I'm going to limit you to that under Marcy's law. Go ahead. Okay, the, the declarations that they signed under the penalty of perjury, I've read that. that's what I'm talking about. Okay, okay, and that, what I want to say, Your Honor, is they have nothing else to add in okay. addition to that. Okay, um, I cannot, though, tell you whether or not this chart um, the, the, this chart that was prepared for you, I cannot tell you whether or not that is accurate. I don't need you to. Okay, I just, and, and you have that, so I cannot address that. If there's anything in these statements um, that you've obtained that we have not obtained, um, I cannot address that. So that's I, true. so I, that's, that's the point I wanted to make was we've, we've talked, you know, their, their thoughts and their opinions have been presented to the court. Um, they reaffirm those. And uh, they really had nothing to add. Um, there, there was one victim that wanted to comment on the the DA's office, the way um, the criminal justice system, the way that the sex crimes were dropped at the last hour without notice, um, those sort of things. But I'm not sure that that's something that you need to hear about for purposes of sentencing. If it is. Um, I, I can let you know what she thought about that. Well, if she's upset about the plea, and I don't know, if, well, I think I do have an idea of which victim that is, 
Um, she had a right to know that the plea deal went down. She had a right to know, uh, to, to have made comment about it. But ultimately, she does not have the right to decide how the case is disposed of. Correct. So I just want, she did, she did make a point of that. I think that if she were up here to talk herself, she probably would want to talk about that. But I'm not sure that you need that for purposes of sentencing. I don't, and I did read that. I mean, I'm, Mr. Gill, I've been trying with all due respect since July to get as much input as I get from the victims to make the appropriate judgment. That's, that's what I'm doing. Right. I don't judge the conduct of the DA's office, the defense, or the sheriff's department. I'm judging the defendant's conduct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill, you're welcome. Yes. S.H. has a statement. Can you just come to the podium, please, and state your appearance, please? And who do you represent? I'm sorry. Sure. Elliot Jung and I represent both K.P. and S.H. Okay. And you have a statement from? K.P. K.P. And if I could just have a moment after I'm done with K.P., I just want to clarify with S.H. on whether or not she wants to read her statement or if she wants me to read it. That's entirely appropriate. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. And this is for K.P. It's difficult to find the right words to describe how I felt when I arrived at Las Colinas Detention Facility on the night that I was arrested by Richard Fisher. It was the only moment throughout the night that I cannot simply put into words, although I can, however, remember how cold it was that night and how I was wearing sweatpants, knee-high socks, slippers, two shirts, and a sweatshirt, or how I could feel my face get hot as I washed my car, get put on the tow truck, and the anxiety I felt knowing that it's the day before Thanksgiving and my son was going to wake up and me not be there. How uncomfortable it was to have a deputy take one pat down and turn it into multiple searches, not to mention the shock, disgust, insecurity, and utter vulnerability I encountered as I stood there in handcuffs, and the cold as he took his sweet time using his power to take advantage of my body for his own sexual enjoyment and make me feel like I was nothing, as if I had absolutely no worth and stood an inch tall with no way to protect myself, the nervous sickness in my stomach as I felt the bulge in his pants pressed up against me. With all the emotions and confusion, I was in no way prepared for the fear and intimidation that overcame me as he stopped the car down that dark dirt road and asked me if I was scared. It was as if he was testing me. All I could think was that this man, SD Sheriff Deputy Richard Fisher, was going to rape me. When I arrived at Las Colinas, my heart stopped pounding so hard and my hands stopped shaking so uncontrollably. For the first time in my life, I was praying to go to jail. When I got to Las Colinas, it's as if all those feelings warped into one. First there was sadness, anger, disgust, fear, and then relief. In 2016, I wrote a letter to the Internal Affairs, IA, in hopes that it would shed light on Fisher and his abuse of power. Due to the Sheriff's Department's negligence, I, I now carry around this heavy coat of guilt, guilty of the fact I let my fear and doubt hold me back from having the courage to come forward in a more forceful way to ensure that what happened to me wouldn't be swept under the rug. As the number of victims kept multiplying, I was so disappointed in myself, knowing that nothing was done to prevent Fisher from preying on grandmothers, mothers, and daughters. The charges are of no justice against the totality of the acts he committed. There are so many reasons why this sentence is important. Many reasons probably overlooked. For me, it has influential significance. I'm a single mom to a third grade little boy. My son does not know his father, so he looks up to my younger brother for that male guidance. My brother has taught my son how to be tough, helpful, respectful, and honest. My brother is also a law enforcement officer. 
He is a genuinely good person with integrity and a servant's heart. If you ask my son what he wants to do when he grows up, he would tell you he wants to be a cop, SWAT to be exact. My son has always known police to be a sense of security, protection, and honesty. But he knows about this case, he knows of some of the things that Fisher has done. I know his innocent mind doesn't fully understand. I keep telling him that anyone who breaks the law will face the consequences and that even police officers get caught. Like most parents, I cherish the values and the morals that my only son is taught and the ethics he learns that will ultimately mold the man he will become. No matter what happens today, I am worth something. I am somebody. I'm not someone you can just have with your way. I hope the punishment that he receives demonstrates that no one is above the law. Hopefully, uh, he will seek help and finally realize the damage that he's inflicted on not only all of us victims and our family, but our family as well. KP. Thank you, KP. If I could have a moment to talk to SH real quick. John, what I'm going to ask you to do is write your client's name out in full. I'll receive that name, and then I'm going to seal it, okay? Sure. So the appellate court has some record of it. We're we're still off the record, Mr. John. You have that loaded into your database, though. No, I don't.
of a mature. Your Honor, I can just read it from here. Can you do that? Yes. Okay. Let's go back on the record. We have all counsel and the defendant present. Okay. When I found out I would be able to speak my mind regarding the, the impact and the effect it's had on both me and my family today from what, from what happened and what the defendant should receive as time is served, I knew exactly what to say. But when you put pen to paper, you get lost. We all know what the defendant has done. We all know what he utilized. We all know how he utilized his position as a sheriff to commit these crimes. However, only, only the victims and their families know at first hand the fear from the crime itself and the overwhelming fear of the repercussions of, committing, of coming forward against the same people who are supposed to protect them. What started out as a routine traffic stop on a rural road late at night has now taken two years from my life and from my family's as well. <clears throat> that night, I had argued with my boyfriend and was on my way to my daughter's when I was pulled over. I knew I was in trouble. No tail light, suspended license, no registration. I thought for certain I was going to jail. Instead, I was sentenced to two years of my life and my family's life to be taken away, never to be regained. That night, I was searched inappropriately. My vagina was touched, my buttock, buttocks cuffed and fondled, while my hands restrained behind my back, all by an officer of the law. I recall that night and how difficult it was for me to wrap my brain around what was happening. Today, I can't wrap my brain around driving to the store. I think everything bad that happens is linked to this case from me coming forward. For example, I tried getting counseling and my Medi-Cal is discontinued. I file my tax return and I get audited by the county tax treasurer and I don't even own any property. When I first told my boyfriend what had happened, he seemed angry at me. But then I felt that he didn't even believe me, which caused me to not want to be intimate. He finally gave up and has moved to live with his daughter in Indiana. We were together for five years prior to this. The effect this has had on my family is the worst part of all. My son has been arrested at his home on three separate occasions by the same officer who happens to live in the same town as the defendant. All three arrests were from, the same, from some unknown alleged warrant on a 2013 DUI case where the probation period had expired by two years. There never was any warrant and he was released each time but only after we posted bail. He used to be an avid surfer. He's lived in the same home for 18 years. He's not only afraid to step outside in fear of being arrested, but he's embarrassed to face his neighbors. I believe this was indeed retaliation due to this case. I have no life. For two years, I've lived in fear and constant stress. I've become an emotional wreck. It's gotten so bad that it's affected me mentally and physically and is the underlying cause of numerous recent health problems. The defendant deserves to serve the maximum amount of the time possible. I feel that this will allow us to not have to worry about him on the streets while we try to move forward, allowing us to us the time he's taken from us to find some relief. By the time he gets let out, I want for me and my family to be far away and out of California. I want for us by then to have moved on with our lives. I know it will take time, but I want it to be time he is in prison. Most importantly, I want the defendant, to be, the defendant to be forced to register as a sex offender. I will never heal or live free, free of fear or be able to restore my trust in our system if he is, a, if he is able to do this again. 
I cannot understand how sexual registration could even be a question in this case. I feel the risks are much too great later on when, when and if his daughter reaches the age where she wants to have sleepovers and the possibilities of what could happen makes my gut wrench. I am not happy with the plea offered on this case. I feel that because he committed these crimes while on duty and under the color of authority, he should have been held at a higher standard. Instead, he was, I feel like he was given leniency. Maybe if I had been informed of Penal Code 17B4 prior, I would have found the courage to speak up sooner. I'm speaking now, and I pray that the courts will take my words into today into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming forward. I really appreciate it. Mr. Jung, anything else from Mr. Yeah, Mr. Delano, you're not appearing on the civil. Is there any other victims that wish to communicate with the court? Yes, you may. Mr. Gillian, um, back on September 4th, 2019, on the same date we received all the declarations. And in that case, he did say that um, he represented Michelle Y um, and that her declaration was forthcoming in the near future. We never did receive that, um, but to this date, our understanding is that he does still represent her. It was, she was never represented by Mr. Gillian, to our knowledge. Gillian, do you know if you represent Michelle White? I do. Okay. I do. Thank you. Okay. Um, regarding the victims, anything else from the people? No. All right. Do the people wish to make a statement? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and serve. This is the reason we have a police force. The police are there to protect the general public from the evil that walks among us. The police exist to serve the public good. But what happens when the system that is supposed to defend the public instead does the public harm? When those who are supposed to be dedicated to upholding the law clearly set out to break it. When the police neglect their duties, or even worse, victimize members of our own community, victim after victim after victim after victim. This court heard every victim testify in this case and is intimately familiar with the facts. In a two and a half year period, Richard Fisher preyed upon 16 separate <coughs> women in our community all the while on active duty as a sworn police deputy sheriff. Fisher was in full uniform, driving a marked patrol car, his police issued firearm baton and handcuffs in tow. He had the power of the badge, the authority to detain, arrest, carry weapons, use force, call for backup. Defendant had sheer police power over these women and he knew it. He chose vulnerable and defenseless women, targeting the very people he was entrusted to help and protect. Vulnerable, 
whether it be because they were victims of domestic violence, residential burglary, threat of violence, suspicious circumstances, or welfare checks. With six of these victims, Fisher was responding to a 911 call, a call for emergency services before re-victimizing them again. In five of the instances, Fisher returned to homes after the 911 call had been cleared, without invitation and without lawful legitimate purpose. In eight of the cases, Fisher targeted women he detained and or arrested, some women he himself placed in handcuffs, rendering them completely powerless to defend themselves. Touch these victims' breast, genitals, buttocks, women placed in his care and his custody. None of the women felt they had any choice in the matter but to submit and acquiesce to Fisher's authority. These women were in no position to refuse. And Fisher was banking on the notion that these victims would never tell. And even if they did report, no one would ever believe them. It would be his word against theirs. But when it came to Kristen H., Fisher was sorely mistaken. Kristen had the courage and the strength to report Fisher's conduct to the Sheriff's Department, which then gave other victims around the county the courage to do the same. On September 9th of this year, 19 months after this case was filed, the day that this case was set to go to jury trial, this defendant, Mr. Fisher, acknowledged his guilt and accepted responsibility for his criminal actions against all 16 victims. The overwhelming majority of the victims wanted this case to resolve shy of going to trial. This plea was just, this plea is appropriate. Each of the 16 victims were accounted for in this plea. The defendant stands here before your honor convicted of seven counts. He has been convicted of four counts of felony assault under color of authority, two misdemeanor counts of assault under color of authority, and one count of misdemeanor false imprisonment. None of these charges mandated sex registration However, it is discretionary according to the plea agreement. At the time that this plea was entered into, the people made every effort pursuant to Marcy's law, the Constitution, and this court's order on several occasions to let the victim's voices be heard. The evening before our status conference on this case, on July 10th, 2019, as this court indicated in what's now marked as Courts Exhibit 1, the people and the defense received an email from the uh, victim's civil attorney, Mr. Gillian. At that time, Mr. Gillian represented 15 of the 16 victims. In that email, and I'll read it exactly, now marked as Courts Exhibit 1, Mr. Gillian wrote, in the people's, um, I have confirmed that none of my clients who are victims in the people's case are demanding that Mr. Fisher plead guilty to a felony or register as a sex offender. Each of my clients would prefer that this case not proceed to trial and instead be resolved with a plea deal. As the court previously indicated, um, during the status conference on the next day of July 11th, that put the people uh, in a different position. The court on that date ordered the people again to try to discuss and see if this in fact reflected the victim's true desires in this case. And we have made numerous efforts to that end. On September 4th, 2019, we received both the prosecution, the defense, and the court got an email, again from 15 
victims, uh, the attorney representing 15 victims, Mr. Gillian at the time, and I'm sorry, it was 14 declarations and Mr. Gillian indicated that a 15th from Michelle Y would be forthcoming. <coughs> Those declarations were all signed by 14 victims under penalty of perjury. All 14 victims acknowledged under penalty of perjury that they were advised of the terms of the plea agreement. 13 of those victims stated they consented to the terms of the plea agreement. Only one woman in her declaration said she was advised of the terms of the plea agreement but refused to comment and still has not commented. All 13 of the victims that commented stated, and I'm going to read this again in quotes, I do not feel strongly that Deputy Fisher should be required to register as a sex offender, nor do I make any other request about his sentence, as long as Deputy Fisher admits what he did to me. Those statements were in their declarations of 13 victims. Nine victims stated, quote, Although I feel strongly about what Deputy Fisher did and the harm he caused the victims, I also feel compassion for his family and do not want them to suffer the consequences of him having to register as a, as a sex offender." End quote. After um, receiving these declarations and the people making numerous attempts to reach the victims in this case, um, some of which to this date we still have been unable to. And as the court indicated, um, it is probation's statutory job to interview the victims or make an effort to, and still probation was unable to communicate with some of the victims. We have the benefit now here before, um, before the court to have three psychiatric evaluations. Um, the defendant underwent three forensic evaluations from three respected um, psychiatrists in the community, Dr. Clipson, Dr. Carroll, who was appointed by the court, and Dr. Lipson, L-I-P-S-O-N. All three doctors reached the same conclusion that sex registration was not appropriate under the circumstances. These doctors found further that when stripped away of his power, the defendant being stripped of his badge and position of authority and trust, he did not pose a risk to the community for reoffending. The issues before the court are twofold. One, should he be required to register as a sex offender? And two, what is the appropriate amount of custody, if any? Now that we have the benefit of the three doctors uh, in this case stating that 290 is not appropriate in this case, coupled with signed declarations by 14 of 16 victims saying they are not demanding defendant register as a sex offender, the people at this time are not asking that from the court. The people are, however, asking this court to take into consideration all of the victim statements, the defendant's conduct, and sentence him to the maximum under this deal of five years in prison. This request is based on several factors. First, the nature, the seriousness, and circumstances of these crimes. This defendant was a sworn police officer to protect and to serve. He victimized 16 women over a two-year period, all while on duty and in uniform. And although he didn't use his weapon during any of the crimes, he didn't need to. And the court heard that during the preliminary hearing. It was enough that the victim saw his uniform and that they saw what was on his belt. All of the victims in this case were extremely vulnerable, either because they were victims of crimes or because they were in his custody. Defendant inflicted emotional injury and the court had the opportunity to hear from two victims, two women, brave women in this case who came forward and talked to you about the emotional trauma that they are still suffering two years later as a result of his actions. Not only do all 16 of these women currently have difficulty trusting law enforcement, but the defendant through his actions has undermined the faith and the trust of the public as a whole in our law enforcement. 
He took advantage of a position of trust, and that's what this case is about, and that is what he pled guilty to. He used his position of authority to target defenseless women, the very people that he was entrusted to help. This court must send a very strong message that you will not tolerate this behavior. Hold those who abuse their positions of trust accountable. It was not easy for any of these women to come forward back then, and as the court can see, it's not easy for them to come forward some two years later here today. The defendant was a law enforcement officer, and he should be held to the highest standard and should be sentenced accordingly. I would ask this court and urge this court to listen to the words that you just heard in this courtroom from KP about the fear and intimidation that she suffered, that she was happy when she got to jail because she was worried of the worst of being raped by the defendant. The words also of Shelly H and how on that evening she was stopped and is still daunted by that evening some two years later. So society must once again be able to fully trust those given the task of protecting and serving. The people respectfully ask this court to sentence the defendant, punish him, and send a strong message to others in a position of trust that they are not above the law and that society will not tolerate this. We ask your honor respectfully to sentence the defendant to the maximum under this plea agreement of five years in state prison. Thank you, your first and foremost, 
that he has failings, that he did fail in this regard. And he admitted that conduct, the seven counts of the 149 and the 1236, but he admitted those seven <coughs> counts which encompassed all of the victim witnesses as part of the plea deal. And I want to acknowledge that he did do that. He accepted responsibility for the conduct in which he engaged. That point being said, Your Honor, I wanted to put that up front, that he's admitting his failings, because I'm going to then go next into the good things about him, the good points about him, so that Your Honor takes those on balance. And I wanted the victim witnesses to know that each of them, and also Mr. Fisher, have good points and they have bad points. They have strengths and they have weaknesses, as in everyone. He deeply regrets his actions, he wishes to apologize, and he expresses his remorse. He wrote a letter, which I will address in part, part now and part at the end, Your Honor. He said this statement to probation, and it was set forth in the probation report, that he wanted to express his sincerest remorse for my conduct toward each person I offended. After the court's ruling regarding the 149 and hearing the women's testimony at the preliminary hearings, I understood how people have been intimidated in responding to me based on me wearing a badge. Through counseling and conversations with my legal team, the court's input, the DA's input, the victim witness's input, I wanted to accept responsibility for my conduct. I in no way wish them harm, and I'm extremely remorseful. I think that's important to get out first and foremost, Your Honor, and to the victim witnesses in this case. The other thing that I would like to point out to Your Honor is something that the victim witnesses said. They, many of them, not each, because they're all different, I think I've said that, but many of them felt that they did feel that the conduct was basically done, and was, during the scope and course of employment, while he was at work. And as Ms. Fox indicated, he will never again be able to work in law enforcement. He has lost the career of his dreams. He was always a protectorate. He went into the military and served. He went into the police department and served. And he served honorably in both capacities for many years. He will never again have a job in law enforcement. And so that, I think, speaks to Your Honor's and their concern as to whether or not he would engage in this type of conduct. The psychiatrists and psychologists, all three renowned experts, all three have been relied upon this court, while you were a DA and also as a judge, and the district attorney's office for their insight into multiple defendants and cases and victims across our history with them. So they are all fair, unbiased, independent thinkers. And Mr. Dr. Carroll was appointed by the court. You know, he works and gets, so he's completely independent, has nothing to do with defense counsel, and he has given his unbiased opinion as to what should be done in this case. Many of the victim witnesses wanted counseling. Many said, I want him to get some help. I want him to get some counseling. I want him to understand what he has done. I want to reassure them that through those three psychological and psychiatric reports, that process began. He is in, and before that, actually, when he was on bond awaiting the trial in this case, he was in counseling, and he has been in counseling and working with a counselor, two different ones, as a matter of fact, a marriage and family counselor conjoined with his wife, and also his own independent psychoanalysis person, who has made great progress in his understanding, and that evolved and eventually ended in a guilty plea in this case. So I want to reassure Your Honor and the victim witnesses that that counseling that many of them asked for and wanted to be part of the punishment in this case began before we got here today. It isn't as if Your Honor has to order him to start counseling at some point in time. He's already began that. I would urge Your Honor to allow him to continue that at some point through the process. In addition, Your Honor, most of them indicated when, at some point, that they wanted some time in custody. The difference between jail and prison was 
back and forth. Um, and again, they're not all lawyers, and some of them um, don't understand, you know, whether it's a felony or misdemeanor, the ins and outs of registration and that sort of thing, and I'm not expecting them to do so. But they have all asked, we're not, don't, we don't really care about the time. We leave that up to the judge. When they did comment, some said, I think a year would be appropriate. I think some time would be appropriate. There was only really one person, I think two, um, SG and SH, uh, Soma G and SH. Only two indicated they wanted the max or something to that effect. Obviously, SH here today and SG, um, I believe at some point, said that to somebody. Um, but they're not, as a group, those 14 of the 16 are not asking for the maximum amount of time. I know that the district attorney is, but I'm urging your honor to listen, as we indicated we would, to the victim witnesses themselves. They are not asking for the maximum amount of time. They have tempered their request with compassion and understanding of the failings of Mr. Fisher, again I said as a man and as a husband, but recognize his attributes as a father and his war service. Um, again, both probation and prison, as your honor knows, but I say this mostly for the victim witnesses, probation and prison both can require jail or custody time so that my requests here do not fail to encompass the fact that there is punishment involved in the request I am making uh, versus the request that the DA is making. Um, uh, just to reassure the victim witnesses and your honor, he has engaged, I said, in counseling. Um, he also does a weekly sessions at the VA hospital, which is in the medical reports. He gets counseling through the VA as well as also in the documents I submitted to your honor. Uh, a men's Christian outreach organization in which he receives counseling and is of service. He has completed, so you know that his, he doesn't just say this, but he actually has done conduct to make amends and to try and make this right. That conduct, again, he can't go to the victim's homes and help them clean up their yard or do something personal. That would not be appropriate and he has not done that. But what he has done is given service to his community. He has served and volunteered right here locally at the San Diego Food Bank. He has um, done outreach through that Christian ministry and men's group. He has um, assisted um, other nonprofit groups, church, in the needs that they have around their establishments. And he's done a 45, uh, I have added four, one additional hour, so 46 hours of community service before he got here today. So that means he is t listening to the victim witnesses, even if they don't think he is, taking into account what they wish to see happen in this case, which is fundamentally change. Change in Mr. Ricky Fister's conduct. And that change has already begun through the counseling and through his community service. And I wish to reassure them and your honor that he has not taken this lightly, that he has begun that process of change. Now, right now I wish to go to Mr. Fisher's family history. Mr. Fisher's family is present in the back left, your honor's left section, my right. His family is present here today. His mother, his father, aunts and uncles, and friends of the family. They are here to support him in addition to the many, many letters you received attesting to his character, and you may snort at that, and the victim witnesses may laugh or squawk at that, but he does have... Did I snort? No, I'm, I'm not saying you did. I'm just saying, when I say character, I have to admit that he has failings too. What I'm trying to show is that he also has good character points, Your Honor, and I know that may be disquieting to some of the victim witnesses to hear, but it is true. His family was a very devout Christian family. There were four of them in that household. He has three brothers and sisters, one who is in Israel um, serving God, another who is a minister serving God. They have made their life's career out of serving God and of doing good and right things. 
Ricky Fisher, when he went into the military and into law enforcement, also believed that he was serving God and country. He has been raised as a devout believer, and he has raised his own family that way. You've seen that in the psychological reports. Uh, Mr. Dr. Lipson went to his family home and saw all the, the photographs, and it's a, a very fundamental Christian home, um, uh, proud of their faith and their family. I say that to you, Your Honor, because whatever God you believe in or whatever religious, I'm not picking one or the other, his belief system is devout, and he has prayed with his Christian men's group and it is outreach to find compassion and understanding for what he's done and to get better. He, some people do it in different ways, and part of the way that Mr. Fisher has done this is through prayer with his family and his group and to let your honor know that he is truly remorseful and sorry for his conduct. He has um, bought and purchased a home in their neighborhood um, with their neighbors who are, uh, some are also devout. His daughter goes to a Christian preschool and he, and she's about to start school <laughs> at the school that is two uh, blocks away. He's within the zone if he were have to have to register on you know, it. The family would have to basically sell that home because that residence would not be allowed to be their residence if he were forced to register. And that, I believe, is why the many women victim witnesses in this case spoke out of compassion for his family because they understand and understood the hardship that his family, I'm not talking about him, just his family would have to suffer when she was gone and lived in that neighborhood her entire life. All her friends and community are in that area and that she would be uprooted basically from the church that's close by and her school that's within the, the radius of if she would have to register. So. I believe that was the understanding. I didn't talk to them personally. I went through their lawyer. But I believe that was the understanding that I think they're trying to communicate to Your Honor when they request that Your Honor not require the registration for Mr. Ricky Fisher. In addition, Your Honor, I would like to discuss Mr. Fisher's military history. It is laid out in full of the handbook that Your Honor asked me to submit, which I did. But the part that I'll refer to is the part that you will make public, which is the part discussed in the psychiatric and psychological reports. So that part, I think, is a very important component of Your Honor's sentencing in this case. His service to his country, I think, cannot be ignored. He, from 2005, when he joined the Marines Reserve to when he was called up, he volunteered for combat in Afghanistan. He put his hand up. Many men and women have put their hand up to serve our country so that we can have democracy, so we can have this exact justice system, so that we can have jury trials, so that we can have a judge sit in judgment of a defendant who pleads guilty. All of this is part of the democracy and the freedom for which young men and young women go abroad and fight and die for their country. And that's what Ricky Fisher did. He raised his hand and he went toward battle when many of us did, do not do that, do not seek to defend our country physically. We may do it in other ways for our service to the court or to churches or to what have you, but he took a physical <coughs> step and went and served his country and he saw combat, Your Honor. And that was articulated very carefully in the psychological reports that are in front of Your Honor as to that combat and the trauma that witnessing people get blown up by IUDs, get killed, um, that, as we know for our military veterans, that causes trauma. You can't undo that. You can't unsee those things. And I wanted to point you to the Pericles funeral oration. I know it's old, Your Honor, 2,000 years old, but what Pericles said in that funeral oration when he was celebrating democracy, he talks about justice under the law, equal justice under the law, and justice for all under the law. He does not condone mob rule, voting for uh, 
what, how much time a defendant should get. It's not up to a vote by the majority of the populace in the community. It is not done by mob rule. It is done by a fair and impartial judge. That's you, Your Honor. And that's the democracy that Pericles was talking about. And in his funeral oration, which as Your Honor knows, was the foundation for the Gettysburg Address, all funeral orations essentially address the same point. And what they talk about is that fighting for one's country is a great honor. Fighting for one's country is like wearing a cloak that conceals any negative implication in a man's character because his imperfections would be outweighed by his merits as a citizen. Soldiers do not falter in the execution of duty during war, and we should be forgiving of them when they falter at home. He essentially does the analysis that the soldiers put aside their desires and wishes to, to be at home, to be working, to be with family and friends. They put that aside for the greater cause, and society incurs a debt to them for their service, which pe can be repaid later if they misstep and act incorrectly, inappropriately, wrongly in times of peace because we look to what they may have seen and what they may have done, which may have altered their character or altered the way they go about things and expose some needs that, as articulated in the psychiatric report, these are emotional needs. These are not sexual gratification, as the doctors went through very carefully, and which is why Okay, and um, they're all attached, Your Honor, for the record, the media, or anyone who wants to look at that. They're all very highly qualified, and I believe their opinions and their recommendations give this court great insight as to who is Ricky Fisher and what is he all about and what he made these mistakes. That's clear. They all address that. 
he, he committed these wrongdoings, he pled and admitted to them, and they have each gone through, why? Why did this happen? What, what went on here to make someone who was so good and had such a good character, how did he go wrong? And how do we prevent that in the future? And what do we need to do to prevent that in the future? So I think those were all good, pertinent questions of the doctors. They had extensive testing, which uh, Dr. Clipson has the raw data and did extensive testing on sexual attitudes and behavior, the SABI test, mental status examination, the look assessment test, L-O-O-K. Look assessment of sexual interest test. Um, the, the Shipley, S-H-I-P-L-E-Y-2, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test, the MOCA, the Phallus Deception Scale, P-D-S, the Post Traumatic Checklist, which there are five of us, the Minnesota Multiple Personality Inventory, second edition, which is the MFPI, the Multifastic Classic, Hasek, sorry, Sexual Inventory Test, the MSI-2, and the Static 99 Test, along with a four-point risk uh, factors. All of those testing is empirical scientific data that supports their conclusions. This isn't just they're winging it through psychoanalysis. They actually do all the testing and they take the raw data they analyze the raw data through their expertise and they come up with an opinion. And that opinion, Your Honor, was soundly throughout all three experts that he should not be required to register as a sexual offender. And addressing SH, who wants that and is the only person really adamant about that, the answer to that of why is because those are for sexually dangerous predators who predate out in the community and just basically have a mental disease or defect where they cannot help themselves in doing this. I'm short summarizing it. And so after all the analysis, they felt that characterization did not apply. Because when it's not mandatory registration, when there is not a sexual offense pled and proven, then, as Your Honor knows, it is discretionary as to the court as to whether or not this is for sexual gratification. And I submit to you it's for emotional gratification and not sexual, as all the doctors indicated. Even if you were to find that it's sexual gratification, Your Honor, that you must also likewise find that it, he is sexually dangerous to the community. And I believe all experts address that as well, that that is, that is not sexually dangerous to the community. So those are the two findings outlined in the psychological reports that I wish to address. They did a malingering test and found he was not malingering. Um, that he was open, non-defensive, and his test results can be readily interpreted. Um, they, he demonstrates no evidence of a mental disorder that predisposes him to the commission of sexual offenses. And he engaged in uh, inappropriate contact and hugging um, with the women he met while working as a deputy sheriff. That's on page 12 of Dr. Slipson's report. Um, what is the likelihood that he will commit future sexual offenses? Based on the pure data, that likelihood is low. When they scored him on the static 99, basically the point of the static 99 is that 93% of people, 93% with that same score, would not sexually reoffend in that time period that's allotted for the static 99. 93%. So he's in that very high category of people not likely to reoffend, And that is the scientific data and the doctor's report that support my request and the DA's request to your honor to not require uh, Mr. Fisher to register. In addition, Mr. Dr. Clipson indicated what are his treatment needs. Again, just like the victim witnesses in this case felt, Mr. Fisher does not require sex offender treatment. He would greatly benefit from more conventional individual psychotherapy, focusing on helping him identify and express his needs and feelings in a more direct and appropriate manner. So he has needs and feelings that he suppressed. He acted inappropriately. All the doctors call it boundary violations, that he violated the boundaries. He, as a police officer, should not be flirting with and engaging in conduct. Um, with women. He should not be doing that. He's the one that is supposed to set the boundaries. Even if they say, hey, you're good looking, which lots of them did. 
Um, you're cute. A lot of them, including SH, sent texts immediately after her contact with Mr. Fisher to friends and family saying he was very, very good looking. He was hot. That type of a comment. Nothing about the buttocks and the vagina during those texts. Your Honor remembers from <coughs> the um, reports and the what occurred at the preliminary examination. But that's not important, whether they thought he was good looking or not, in terms of sentencing on this date. Again, um, same comments by many of them in texts or emails or follow-up conversations with their supporting witnesses. He is the one that is supposed to set those boundaries. So even if they thought he was good looking and wished to have consensual contact with him, he's supposed to say no. He's supposed to set those boundaries. And that's what he didn't do. And that's why the doctors indicate that these are boundary violations. They, um, the doctor said he should be doing conjoint therapy sessions with his wife and he should be doing psychological counseling and treatment. And I wish to assure your honor and the witnesses that he has been, as indicated in Dr. Lipson's report, he has been doing that and he will continue to do that. Also, um, he is doing conjoint therapy sessions with his wife. Does the defendant need to register as a sexual offender? Again, it is my professional opinion that not having Mr. Fisher rendered as a sexual offender is not required for the purposes of public safety. He does not pose a significant risk to commit future, because it's all about future sexual offenses. He does not need to be monitored and tracked in the community for this purpose. Again, I pointed out in my papers and documents show that he is eminently Googleable. I don't know if that's a word, but he's, you can find him on the internet just by putting his name in. So he's completely trackable and searchable. His entire history, including some that's accurate, some that's not even accurate, is all out there on the World Wide Web. So the need to track and monitor him on an individual basis isn't um, urgently needed by this court because it's already been done, if you will, by the media. His risk of acting out through boundary violations can be reduced by his involvement in psychotherapy and his not wearing a badge which he won't be able to ever, ever again wear. He is not seeking a further career in law enforcement, and if he did, he would not be able to get one. I believe also, Your Honor, the probation report, I wish to address it shortly, and I did address it in my responding papers, so I'll go to that section now. You know, the probation report it largely um, followed the recommendation of the district attorney in this case. However, they argued for both um, custody and local prison, because these are offenses that fall under AD 109 and are local, um, they're prison, but it's uh, to be served under AD 109. And the, she recommended both custody, a five years with a 3-2 split, that there would be three years in custody and two years on mandatory supervision. That split in the terms of custody was to allow him to get the counseling and the treatment. Again, she emphasized that, that he needed. She, uh, I don't believe, understood the law of people versus she, uh, that you cannot both recommend local custody and registration, yeah. so she asked for both. It's an innocent mistake. I, I understand.
address uh, a couple points um, made by the district attorney in this case. Oh, actually, I'll go to KP's statement and then to the district attorney's statement, if I may, Your Honor. Uh, KP in her statement did address her fears, her concerns, uh, the impact that his conduct had on her. But I wanted to point out, she does not request custody time. She does not request registration in her statement to Your Honor. Um, she signed a declaration of penalty of perjury. She changed counsel after that, saying she did not want those things. She said, maybe I do. But her final statement to Your Honor, I want you to know that her final statement was she wanted the defendant to seek help, to get help. So that is that therapy, that treatment, that is important and imperative to each one of the victim witnesses. Um, that counseling and help obviously cannot um, continue if he is incarcerated um, in local prison. They do have some programs, but you wouldn't be getting the therapeutic um, concerns, the therapeutic treatment that of concern to so many of the victim witnesses. Um, your Honor indicated at one point, not sure which of all our many meetings, so bear with me if I get the date wrong, but I think at one point about it, your Honor had indicated um, that your Honor kind of wanted to, and this is what I, my perception was, so it's wrong, forgive me, to hold Mr. Fisher accountable if and when he were to plead guilty. It may have been after he pleaded guilty, I'm not sure when the discussion was, to hold him accountable for his conduct, which is important, and I would agree with that. No sentencing is. Yes. <laughs> so I think it might have been after the plea, but before sentencing, Your Honor, one of our uh, meetings, our, our sessions. Um, and, I, and that is so important, but I believe that you can hold him accountable best by putting him on a state prison term and giving him a probationary term in which he must report to your honor and fulfill the obligation. So there would be custody time, I believe that your honor thinks would be appropriate. I understand that, we understand that. I'm not arguing against it because I believe that custody time is appropriate. Mr. Fisher knows that, he accepts that. Um, and I think that the sentence can be best achieved, in my opinion, by having a state prison term of some amount, three years is what I would urge the court to do, and stay that prison term and then put him on a grant <coughs> of probation with an understanding that he would do a full year in custody uh, as a, a condition of that probation and that he then seek and maintain psychiatric and psychological relations with such a therapist, that he get the help, that he engage in the community service that he's already begun, and that he begins providing service to his community. I think that sentence to your honor, where your honor keeps control of the case um, and is your, yourself monitoring him through, through and with the probation <coughs> department, but that your honor takes um, the monitoring of this, I think that would allay any victim witnesses fears that the system is corrupt, that he is not, that you're not monitoring this and that you're not taking care of the issue. Um, that's what I would hope that Your Honor would do, that Your Honor would take Mr. Ricky Fisher and place him on a very strict grant of probation with very strict rules and regulations that Your Honor, through the benefit of having these psychological reports, and now 14 out of the 16 victim witnesses statements that they want him to get help. They want him, um, you know, essentially punished by the criminal justice system and they want moreover to make sure that he's fulfilling that. And I think your honor is in the best position to fulfill that need. Um, I think you said at one point that you know you could watch him very carefully if he was on probation to your honor versus um, getting maybe prison with mandatory supervision, that your honor might be able to give it a more individualized attention to make sure all of those rules and regulations are followed. And again, Mr. Fisher is not about trying to break any rules or any more rules, and he would be following everything that Your Honor asked him to do and more. He has, I think, demonstrated that he is amenable to that. He has been on GPS monitoring uh, with CPAC through the Sheriff's Department, so he has not been free to come and go wherever he wants. He's been monitored through the CPAC program uh, after, I think it was your, the second bail. 
he was put on CPAC and he has followed every single rule, every boundary um, that's been imposed on him by CPAC. He has followed their rules and um, I have received and gave to the probation officer a report from CPAC which addressed uh, how long he's been on the CPAC regulations and that was provided to the um, publishment, the probation officer in Imperial County. I know the probation was here, I believe, for two days. She came out to, and she set appointments in those two days for all the victim witnesses that could attend. It was obviously a very short time period, so my understanding through counsel for the victim witnesses is that some of them were just not able to meet that tight deadline and be able to respond to the probation and felt more comfortable giving you their statements as they have here today through their lawyers versus to probation. I don't believe any of them were trying to blow off probation. It was just a very tight time window. She met with me and Mr. Fisher extensively and, um, and documented in here report his remorse, that he was genuine, that he was open, that he was honest to her, um, and he was clearly remorseful for his conduct. I know that the DA has indicated that he should be held to the highest standard because he, all police officers should be held to the highest standard for their job. That is absolutely true, Your Honor, but being held to the highest standard does not mean receiving the maximum sentence. That is not what that means. He has been held to a high standard and he admitted to the conduct that he was charged with when it was finally adjudicated that what the conduct was, he admitted to it. He, with me present by his side and all of us working together, and he did that, Your Honor, in order to demonstrate his obedience to the court and to what's good and what's right and what should be done, he did accept that responsibility. And so I believe that the range from custody time, from no custody time to five years of custody time should be taken into consideration with the mitigants that I set forth in my sentencing documents, his commitment to his family, to his faith, to his country, that those should be weighed on balance for his failings, and that his failings should not be given the max, as it were. Again, no one except for SH and the DA's office is requesting that severe of a sentence. Everyone is asking your honor to temper, or I don't mean temper as in temper, but adjust and reflect upon what is on balance the right, fair, and just sentence in this case. And I believe all parties, um, have put an incredible amount of hard work into this case to get it to this point that we are here today. All the reports, again, have been positive, and not just positive and not registering the psychological reports, but in also what your owner should do in terms of a sentence, because they reflect on all his good character, his service. He was, as a young child, saw essentially a school shooting. The individual did not shoot a bunch of other people. That individual took out a gun right next to Ricky, his little friend, and shot himself in the chest. A suicide right in front of you of a friend has impact. We now know from all the school shootings that we've had that impact that has on kids in the future. And the psychiatrists and psychologists have indicated that, coupled with his service, has an impact. It's not something we can ignore on a person that does something to their emotional well-being. And uh, we're not making excuses, we're just asking Your Honor to take into consideration that that's what made him fail in this regard, and to have compassion and understanding tempered with what needs to be done for punishment. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. This is Sam Preeny from San Diego County Probation. Uh, just to note that the probation officer did recommend that he register for the PC 290, however, also with the recommendation of local prison, that's not if he registers, he will not be eligible right. for the local prison. Um, sec secondly, I have 12 updates for you to the court operation procedure, which is $180. And then if the court is to impose a local prison sentence, if item 1M can also include pass codes and shortcuts. Thank you. Anything else from the people?
what your um, work in the community was all taken into consideration at the time of the plea. Losing his dream job is simply not enough. This is not a probation case. He needs to be punished. There needs to be a message sent to the community. Based on the violation of public trust, the number of victims and targeting particularly vulnerable victims that upon which he inflicted injury, we're asking for the maximum term of five years. Thank you. Mr. John, did you want to answer? Your Honor, I apologize. Um, KP wanted me to submit this to the court. It's a petition uh, that was, as of last night, signed by over 337 people uh, indicating that she is requesting for the max sentence and then also 290 registration. It was signed by both KP and then also SH. And it's also now my understanding that KP wants to come up and would like to say something to the court. Yeah, but that's okay. Yeah, she can come up. We'll receive that as court three. I would object to your honor, it's a mass petition by a group of. Uh, again, it, it doesn't fit neatly in Marcy's law, but I'm willing to accept a petition that one of the victims put together in this case. I don't need to accept the number of signatures as to the veracity of the statement, just how she feels about sentencing. Okay? You will receive it. Um, you're KP? Yes, I am. What would you like me to know? I would just like to speak for myself instead of having all these lawyers speak for me. because well, I always have the opportunity. <laughs> when I started out this hearing, and I asked if anybody wanted to communicate. I gave you the opportunity. I'm still giving you the opportunity. Would you like to communicate to the court? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. I just want to clarify that I do want the maximum sentence. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you coming in. All right, anybody else? Is the matter submitted? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all counsel, both the DA's office, the defense, and all civil counsel for their civility here. Obviously, this is an emotional case. Um, there are numerous victims that are victims, they're not witnesses. Um, this is a, a case that took a toll on a lot of people. And uh, it's important that we remember um, what our system of justice requires, what sentencing actually is, and the goals of sentencing. I want to address the plea for a minute. Um, I would take this plea unless I felt that the parameters of the plea are both adequate for the victims and adequate for the defendant. To do that, I have to know that the case is being properly prosecuted and defended. Otherwise, the system of justice doesn't work. Um, when the parties enter into a plea, when the defense and the prosecution, or I should say the defendant and the prosecution enter into a plea with specific parameters, here a five-year list, it has to be approved by a judge. Right? A judicial officer has to go ahead and approve the deal and make sure that all parties are adequately represented in the case to assure that justice is complete and thorough. Everything I've read, this is the probation report, the psychiatric reports, the wishes of the victim, the defense and prosecution statements, some of the victim statements through counsel, and also, I'm the one who heard all these witnesses testify. And I was able to evaluate the case. Everything I've seen, everything I've heard, everything I've read, tells me that the plea is adequate, it's just, and if I was in the same situation again, I would take the same plea. I think that the five-year lid adequately performs what is needed to be done. I don't take a great deal of exception with the evolving nature of the victim's statements. Um, sexual assault trials are very difficult. Uh, there, there is a Sometimes I wonder, after all the cases that I've done, if the burden is actually higher than beyond a reasonable doubt. I think that victims have a tough time and are in a tough situation when testifying in front of a group of strangers, a jury, who may not be that sympathetic to certain situations that victims find themselves involved in during any particular case. The, the 
prospect of being examined by counsel, both defense and prosecution, and reliving a sexual assault is very difficult for victims. And after I've been doing this for 30 years, there's good literature that there are many times certain victims not only feel re-victimized, but are re-victimized. And that's just the nature of things like post-traumatic stress disorder and having to communicate about an act that was deeply offensive and changes one's life. And having to relive that in court often pretends to create future problems down the road for sexual assault victims, for assault victims generally, too. I mean, the act of having to testify, I wouldn't change it, is very difficult for witnesses. We see this particularly in domestic violence cases, child abuse cases, and sexual assault cases. So the plea itself, as I see it structured, I was trying to calculate why you were all talking about my job and how many pleas I've taken in my career as a judge since I run the settlement departments now here in El Cajon in the past and here I started as a judge in 2003. I think I've taken over 50,000 pleas, which tells me it's time to move on. Um, but that's really a part of our system of justice is accepting pleas. When, when the parties agree to a disposition, while nobody is going to be ecstatic about the disposition, there's a sense of justice when the parties agree to a particular finding or decision. Again, I'll reiterate. I think this is a good plea. I would take it again if I had to. And everything I've read tells me that this is indeed good. Sentencings are based on facts. The facts here are the uh, reports that I've received and also the evidence that I took during the hearings of all the victims. Sentencings are not about politics. And they are not about, in a criminal setting, about other cases. I understand that there's civil cases going on. And i got to tell you the truth, I'm not a civil judge. I don't have any idea what happens in the civil departments. The civil judge who's handling this case, I've never met her. I've never talked to her. And I wouldn't know her if she bumped in. So the case is based solely on the facts that I received during these hearings. I believe that the conduct that the defendant pled to is what the defendant did. I don't have any doubt about that. Um, I presided over the case, heard the witnesses testify, and those are the facts of the case. I can also reach a conclusion that may cause some despair in individuals that the victims are telling the truth. The corroboration that the Sheriff's Department engaged in in backing up their initial investigation was a linchpin in the case. I mean, the vehicle locators, the radio direction, um, all of that was very important in corroborating what the individual victims, 16, 17, had to say. The defendant pled guilty of these charges because he is, in fact, guilty of these charges. I did not take a West plea in this case, so he's not pleading to avoid a greater punishment. And while it is uncanny to see such an evolution of what the desire of victims are in a case that's this large, it's, it's not unpredictable. It's, you can see this happening. We see this in domestic violence cases. We see this in child abuse cases. That Victims will have different feelings about a particular case at different times in the case. That's my job to filter that out. It's my job to understand why, but it happens. It happens. You can have a domestic violence victim initially come in on a case and say, yeah, I'm all for prosecution, and by the time you get to trial, she wants nothing to do with the DA's office. Then she comes in in sentencing, and she may really want the defendant to be sentenced to the max. Those are all appropriate responses under Marcy's law. But that's why sentencing is left to a judge and not to any particular victim of the case, to the DA's office, and to the defense. We 
what is a little bit different about this case is, and, and it has to do with the, the, the nature of the offense, the gravamen of the offense, is that there were individuals who did not want to communicate either with the DA's office or with the probation department, the Imperial County Probation Department. It may be that it's the nature of the offense that since law enforcement, as the defendant had committed his crimes under that color of law, would naturally put the victims in a position where they might be wary of law enforcement. And I think that's just a natural outcome of the defendant's offense. So I'm not taken aback by the victim's conduct, nor am I taken aback by the prosecutor's conduct or the defense conduct. But look, this is just the nature of cases, right? If, if we would have gone to trial on this case, it would have been, at times, a circus, right? There's so many different opinions, there's so many different agencies, there's so many things that are involved in a mass sexual assault case that it's difficult to control all the parties and difficult to control emotions. And those are just natural in cases like this. So I'm not offended in any way by the lack of clarity or the lack of cooperation with law enforcement authorities in this case. I think, I think it's just a natural outgrowth of the defendant's conduct. In the end, I do not doubt that these offenses occurred. I did order the DA's office to communicate with the victims. I asked them to have four questions uh, to the victim. To me, the reason why I did this is that information is power. And the more information I have, the better judge I am. And many of you will disagree with my sentence. That's OK. But I at least like to be informed when I make my rulings. Those questions were, do you want the case to go to trial? It's a basic question. And it's a general question just to get the, the feelings of the temperature of the case. Do you have strong feelings of whether or not the case should be a, a felony or a misdemeanor? Do you have strong feelings regarding whether or not the defendant should register as a sexual offender? And do you have strong feelings about whether or not the defendant should serve time in custody? Those questions are just designed to give me enough information to do the appropriate thing. When I, when I read the courts one and I see that there was a communication that the desire of the victims was to have the case settled as misdemeanors or not, not have 290 registration. That's at that moment in time. I don't doubt the accuracy. It's also for another court to decide. But for my purposes of sentencing, right, it, it's entirely plausible that parties right before trial get awfully reasonable as the jury's coming in. Right? Everybody at the beginning of the case stands pretty tough and it's that, that confidence is eroded as more evidence is created in the case and more difficulties are presented to both sides. I did say that the case needed to resolve and plea. The reason why I said that is not just the documents that we were receiving from the victims, not just from the testimony I heard during the trial, but it's my belief, and still is, that, and, and, and particularly with this plea, that society would be more accepting to the defendant's conduct and sentence if there was an agreement, rather than a trial in which there could be some victims that suffered an acquittal and some that were, their cases resulted in a conviction of the defendant. And it might seem completely unfair to certain victims who testified just like the other victims and wondering why a jury didn't believe victims two, three, and four and believe victims six, seven, and eight. You know, and I, I struggled with that. Um, but I think in, in the end here, I think, and I know that the parameters that I have are adequate. And even if it had gone to a jury trial, I probably would have been thinking to myself after the verdict that it probably, I, I would have started out at a five-year limit. 
I mean, I, I've evaluated all the defendants' conduct. I, I don't have a problem with that list. A word about Marcy's Law. Marcy's Law is a law that was designed to inform victims of the proceeding and give them the ability to be heard. It's, it's, it's not discretionary, but it's more declaratory. There's, there's, there's no enforcement mechanism for Marcy's Law. The law is set really not as a prosecutorial tool, but more as an informative device for judges so they are aware of and understand what the victims in a particular case want. But it's not the judge's job to follow the victim's wishes. Um, in fact, you can imagine a case where one victim wants a particular defendant to get probation and another wants the defendant to get 20 years. Right? Nobody's going to be happy in a case like that. And I brought up domestic violence cases before and child abuse cases, but Marcy's Law, I, I, I have to deal with every day in a moving department post plea. Right? When I'm doing sentencing, even if the defendant stipulates to prison, and I'm sentencing the defendant to prison, the victim may come in and express her desire that her abuser not be punished and she doesn't want a protective order. Well, I heard from her, but I still have to do the right thing, and often I do send the defendant to prison, and I do issue a protective order against the victim's wishes. Children are end up in the same boat, right? They want to see their parents even if they were abused. It's for the court to decide whether or not that's appropriate. It's not for the court to decide that, well, Marcy's law tells me I must follow the victim's wishes. That's an incorrect statement of law. I did consider all the victim's desires. I looked at the chart in, in courts, too. Um, it's interesting. Um, but again, I don't see anything untoward about it. And I appreciate the motivations that the victim's going, for, going through it. But I also appreciate more that the victim's courage to talk to law enforcement after this disaster that the defendant created. Um, they did their job. They testified. I found them believable. And really, now the sentencing, and, and I have to say both sides did their job, too. It's just up to me. I want to talk about the 290 registration for a minute. The issue of registration is not an issue of punishment. And too often, people look at 290, that is to register as a sexual offender, as a draconian punishment rather than as a device to supervise, right? A 290 registration is notice to the community, and it's a way that the defendant can be supervised and has to communicate with law enforcement and tell them where he is at all times. Too often, people see 290 registration, though, as a form of punishment. You did this thus in a retribution form of punishment. They see the 290 as an infliction of um, retribution. It's not designed for that. And it's inappropriate for the court to consider it as a form of punishment under the rules of court. 290 registration also has to be based on a factual finding, right? Those factual findings come from psychiatric reports. They come from a review of conduct. And they, they also come from historical findings if there are older psychiatric reports or evaluations of a particular defendant. Here what has been submitted to me is uh, Dr. Carroll's report, which is a forensic psychologist, psychiatrist from the county of San Diego. That is his specific job. He was not hired by the defense. He was not hired by the prosecution. The defendant was referred to him as an order of the court. Dr. Clipson and Dr. Lipson also did evaluations of the defendant. I was also able to review the defendant's VA reports since there is a long documented history of his conduct while he was involved with the United States Marines. So I, I usually don't get this much data on making a 290 decision um, on any defendant. This is the most I've ever had, I have to say. Um, what the reports say in total is that there's no evidence of paraphilia. There's no clinically significant pathology in the defendant's history. 
that the defendant um, has an emotional motive that is structured around power. And the question asked to each one of the psychiatrists who's duly respected in the county of San Diego is, does it serve the community's needs to have the defendant register as a sex offender? I agree with the DA's um, evaluation of the defense evaluation. I also agree with Dr. Lipson, Dr. Lipson and Dr. Carroll's evaluation that the requirement that the defendant register as a sex offender does not serve the community and serves no purpose at least in my view, other than punishment. Thus, I will not require the defendant to register. The next issue is punishment. Punishment is um, in, in various forms, and I think we need to examine what punishment is. Um, much has been made about people getting sentenced and punished in our society of late, and sometimes Folks rejoice to want one individual sentenced to prison, or other folks are sentenced to you know, local time or probation. Um, it's not an act that we should ever be happy with. It is a, it's a solemn act to sentence somebody on every case, whether it's probation or to prison, or in a capital case or an LY. There are several types of punishment, and there are several sentencing factors involved in punishment. One is retribution. Retribution is almost biblical. It is to punish the defendant and inflict pain because he has caused pain. There is rehabilitation, and that is where, under the punishment model, we look at rehabilitation and we say, is there something to salvage here? Is there an individual who is beyond reproach or beyond Rehabilitation. Is there something that we can extract out of the defendant and make him a model citizen, turn him over to probation, counsel him, and correct his behavior? There's incapacitation. Incapacitation means that the defendant is such a threat to the community that we essentially warehouse the defendant, that we put him in for as long as possible so that he cannot do harm to any other individuals, at least for the period of incarceration. And then there's deterrence. Deter there's two types of deterrence, and most cases don't have a deterrence aspect to them. There's general deterrence where you punish the defendant so that society knows that this type of conduct will not be tolerated, and others who are in a like position will not engage in the particular behavior. And then there is specific deterrence which is to any prospective defendant that you teach the defendant that if he was to engage in specific conduct, again, there would be dramatic repercussions. Further, deterrence actually applies to victims, too. Um, there's a certain deterrence aspect in this case that for victims and victims generally, that they need to know whatever their background is, whatever their dilemmas are, whatever their problems are that brought them to a court or to law enforcement, that they will be treated fairly no matter who the defendant is. Right? I mean, this, this is kind of the issue in this case is that the victims feel very insecure about the criminal justice system, they feel insecure about law enforcement because they look at the stature of a defendant in uniform and wonder, maybe rightfully, that can they get a fair shake? Would somebody who lives in Carmel Valley or La Jolla be in a different position than somebody who has a drug problem from El Cajon? That's, that, that is the essence of where deterrence has to go, that these individuals understand that they'll be treated fairly. What one commentator, um, I forget, I think I was in law school when I heard this, that if justice isn't for everybody, then it really isn't for anybody. And that's all about equality, right? It's about equality that everybody will be treated under a system of justice. Here are these victims in this particular case, Mr. Fisher's victims. They were uh, 
some are uh, people that are down on their luck um, that uh, were vulnerable. Uh, people who uh, one woman had called in uh, as a domestic violence call, another woman who was running a board care home. Uh, but they were all in a position of weakness even before they met the defendant. When I say weakness, I don't mean moral or physical or emotional weakness. They were in a position where they had to call law enforcement. And we all expect that when we call law enforcement that, you know, you look at our deputies in this courtroom, right? They're their uniforms are iron, their, their badges are shiny, there's a certain decorum and respect that we expect out of our law enforcement officials when they come to our homes or come to our place of work when we're in need. So that when you're in need, you believe these people, you believe law enforcement is going to be there for you. So these victims are entitled to the same protections of our society and our criminal justice system that others who are more fortunate seem to enjoy. To do otherwise would erode the confidence in our democracy and our institutions. And isn't that really the biggest problem in our society today, right? That uh, our institutions are um, having some difficulties with credibility. We've become skeptical of these institutions, whether it's churches or courts or law enforcement, political officials, medical professionals, educational professionals, and dare I say it, political leaders. So we need trust to be secure. Democracies derive power from the consent of those governed. Let me say that one more time. Democracies derive power from the consent of those governed. We consent to be governed. We consent to be ruled by the rule of law. Democracy is eroded when that power is arbitrarily applied. And let me give you an example as I grow older. Back in the 80s, I was a, a paramedic and, uh, in Santa Barbara County. And we used to have these things called move-ups, which is when the Carpinteria unit went out on a call the Santa Barbara unit, which I was one of, had to go halfway between Carpinteria and Santa Barbara. Usually this was in the middle of the night. And we would sit in a parking lot that was not well lit. And we would just sit there. It's actually a form of torture. But uh, we would sit there, but we overlooked an intersection. And I was always amazed as I was there for 10 years looking at this intersection. It was a four-way intersection in the middle of the night. And people would come up to it, some too fast, some maybe a little too slow. But they'd always stop at the intersection, even though it was at the middle of the night. They always followed the law. There were very few people who just ran right through it. Probably if they did, we would have called it in. But everybody stopped. I mean, it was, it was amazing. And you think about that. And when I've traveled in other countries, people don't do that. It's the rule of law. We are ingrained in it as, as Americans. We expect others to follow the rule of law. We expect to follow the rule of law. And it says this adherence to these standards that are important. From that adherence, there's an expectation of fairness. It doesn't happen in all countries. It happens here. No matter what you read, no matter what you see, no matter what you think, watch a four-way a four stop sign and see what happens. We follow the rule of law because we believe in justice and we've believed in it from an early age. It needs to be protected. It needs to be fought for. It requires a never-ending battle to make sure the right thing is done. You have to fight for justice. It's not passive. It's not like the Statue of Liberty that stands up to the storms on the East Coast, strong and proud. Justice is in every one of us, and justice requires each one of us to give up something for it. And it needs to be protected at all times. I read the um, defendant's family's letters. I, I believe you. I believe your, what you wrote in your letters. I empathize with you. And unfortunately, you are collateral damage. And this is, 
you know, as a result of the defendant's conduct. I appreciate the defendant's military conduct. You have fought for this courtroom and what we've done here in court today. You fought for the system of justice that is going to deal with you in just a few minutes. Your conduct, though, strikes at the heart of our belief in the rule of law. Think of the chilling effect that women will have in calling law enforcement. There was a case here in the late 80s, the Craig Pyer case, and that really changed how women viewed law enforcement and getting pulled over on the side of a lonely road. And having some legitimate fears about law enforcement officials. This case, too, strikes just at the heart of that. This has chilled women's ability to communicate with law enforcement. And I don't think that comes across to you, Mr. Fisher, or unfortunately to another set of victims, and that is your family. That they see you differently than an individual wearing a uniform who's abused women. And that has a chilling effect on the criminal justice system. Police officers and sheriff's deputies who respond to calls will walk in to a residence now and feel untrusted. And that creates safety risks. It creates risks to the victims. It creates risks to the individual deputies. It also increases the likelihood of abuse to other victims similarly situated in that a domestic violence victim, a child abuse victim, may not call in. So the gravamen of your offense, the gravamen of your crimes is not that you hugged somebody. The gravamen of your offense, the severity and seriousness of your crimes, is not that you were overzealously trying to help people in need. The gravamen of your offense is that you acted under the color of law in a uniform. You took advantage of victims. You took advantage of your position. You isolated these victims. In each case, they were isolated. You had repetitive contact with them. You served your authority by getting their phone numbers and calling them consecutive times consistently. You operated with impunity, believing that you would never get caught. And you operated like that because you thought that nobody would ever believe you. So there's never an issue of consent when you're in uniform. Even if one of the women said, okay, you can hug me, when you're in uniform and you have a gun on and you have that type of authority, there never can be consent. So my sentence has to assure everyone that our society recognizes the gravity of your conduct. There's a deterrence aspect that I need to send a message that those who take advantage of the position of power will not yield that power to have a reduced sentence. Unfortunately, you disgraced your uniform. You disgraced these deputies that are in my department every day who protect me, who protect the clerks, who protect all the public and the attorneys in the courtroom. You disgraced the Marine Corps. And I don't know if you get it. I can't imagine what you were thinking. It was just conduct that was abhorrent to the appropriate behavior of a law enforcement official. You're statutorily eligible for probation. Under Rule 414B1, B3, B4, you have no prior criminal record. You appear willing to comply with the terms and conditions of probation. You're 33 years old. Circumstances that support the denial of probation is that you were armed. You had a weapon. The victims were particularly vulnerable. You inflicted both 
physical and emotional injury. I do agree with the probation department under Rule 414A8 that it was a sophisticated crime. Maybe one or two victims, I, I wouldn't agree with sophistication, but it was continual. And it went over a period of years. I mean, it's just shocking that it could go on. You took advantage of a position of trust and confidence to commit the crime. You were a sworn peace officer. Though you're statutorily eligible for probation, I'm going to deny probation. I think that your crimes warrant a uh, prison commit. Because I'm not requiring you to register under Penal Code Section 290, it is a local prison commit, which I would prefer anyway, and I'll explain that in a bit. The voters passed AB 109. That's all of you. That is the law of the state of California. And under AB 109, um, it empowers the court to, it requires the court to sentence the defendant to what is now called local prison. It's run by the sheriffs of the state of California. But better than parole, there is a supervision aspect of AB 109. And that is conducted by a court who does mandatory supervision hearings and by the probation department which engages in enhanced supervision of any individual who is granted um, mandatory supervision. I believe that some supervision is necessary in this case. And I say some. Um, there are a couple reasons why I think supervision will be important. One is that when the defendant is to no longer be in prison, to let him out on his own with no structure, I think would be a serious flaw in my sentencing. I think he needs to be supervised. The defendant would also then receive continual psychological examinations and evaluation. He would also be required to wear a GPS device when he is released from prison. I think all those things are good, productive um, aspects of sentencing. But there, there needs to be an incapacitation part here. There needs to be a lengthy prison sentence for the defendant's failure and the harm that he's caused to not only the victims, but other law enforcement officials in society. So um, this is how I'm going to do the sentence, Ms. Simpkin. Um, on count one, the upper term of three, and then counts two, three, and four, one third the mid consecutive. I'm going to um, use consecutive sentence in this case since these are different victims, different vulnerabilities, um, and also a course of conduct that ranged over a long period of time over multiple victims. I think that the appeals court will sustain me on consecutive sentences. So the total term is five years. You will do 44 months in custody. You will be under mandatory supervision for 16 months. I will impose all terms and conditions as listed in the order granting probation. On the um, actual sentencing fines, Ms. Imprini, um, under 1202.4 and 1202.45. And the fine should be made the same whether or not, despite how the split is done. Uh, in court operations, we would still be what, what page is that on? Uh, page 42. Some, some of the conditions are in the big court and some of them are on the mandatory supervision. The IC and A would be 210. Under 1202.4, what's the fine? I can't hear you. 
I'm calculating in my head. I'm sorry. So it's uh, on the on the probate on the misdemeanor probation cases. I'm going to make that credit for time served and deny probation. Okay. Okay. So on the four felonies that exist, right? So it's. Six thousand dollars per cent of twelve two point four, six thousand per cent of twelve two point four five, that's suspended. And then seven counts. Two hundred and ten dollars per cent of twelve oh two point percent of the that's the uh, critical, needs. critical needs account. Uh, Court operations fee would be twenty. All right, and then CJA is still 154. All right, right. You, right, you have a right to appear for any restitution hearing or review. You want to give that up and allow Ms. Von Helder to report it? Yes. All right, so additionally, what I'm going to do, I'm going to reserve on the issue of restitution. Um, I'm going to ask the parties to calendar the restitution review in Department 1904 on March on March the 3rd. Just calendar it and I'll set a date, okay? okay. 1904 is subject to Okay. Um, the probation department completed a prohibited person's relinquishment form. The defendant has no reportable firearms. You may not possess or own any firearms, ammunition, or magazines. Anything else from the people? No. From the defense? Oh, yeah. Ms. Imprimi, anything else? Yes. Now, clerk, follow the deputy's directions, please. Matters of justice. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Morning, Your Honor. Still morning. We had the motion this morning, Your Honor. And you are? Gary Aguirre. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Uh, we, I understand that there was a filing uh, in relation to our motion on Friday. It was not.